Mark chapter number seven, Mark chapter number seven in your Bible. I need to apologize for my voice. It is a little, uh, little rough this morning, a little raspy. I've been preaching every day of the week. I was in Washington, Illinois, and then uh, my travels took me to Gulfport, Mississippi, and I was in Mississippi for a few days, and I preached four times on Thursday. And uh, was just losing my voice this time of the year or two with the allergies, and I just kind of uh, experienced that. I can remember years ago, I had lost my voice. This is year. This has been. This has been years ago. And if my wife knows where I'm going with the story, she's she's cautioning me not to tell it. Don't believe I'm getting ready to tell this, but uh, years ago I had lost my voice, and I was um, driving. I was living in in West Virginia. And I was driving to Columbus, Ohio, because I was going to fly out of there and preach somewhere. I don't even remember where, but my voice was gone. It was worse than it is right now. And um, I was looking for anything to, to bring it back. And an evangelist called me. He just happened to call my cell phone. And I was on my way to the airport. And this evangelist has a, a booming voice. And I thought, man, the Lord has had this guy call me to help me. And so I, I talked to him for a few minutes. I said, hey, brother. I said, uh, I said, I need some help. My voice is rough, and, and can, you, can you help me? And this man said, Brother Judah, I'll tell you exactly what to do. Now, I have learned since then that when people say, I'll tell you exactly what to do, normally, that's a bad option, all right? But uh, he said, I'll tell you exactly what to do. He said, you need to, you need to find the nearest store. You need to go to the tea section. You need to find Yogi Tea. That's the name of it, Yogi, Y-O-G-I, Yogi Tea. And there is a tea there called Throat Coat. You need to get it. He said, he said uh, start, start drinking it immediately. Drink as much of it as you can, throat coat. And I'm thinking, I'm, okay, okay. I'm looking at my watch and my time, and I, I don't have a whole lot of time, but I pulled off uh, at an exit. I found the nearest store. I ran into a Kroger. I found the Yogi Tea. I saw throat coat. I grabbed it as soon as I possibly could, checked out, got to my car, shoved it in my bag, ran to the airport through security, and, and I had a few minutes to catch my flight. And so, I can't believe I'm telling this, but uh, I uh, had a few minutes, so I went to a coffee shop, and I just got some hot water, and I dug in my bag, pulled out some of that tea, put it in there, and, and made a cup of the tea, put it down, got on the plane, and everything was fine. Put the seatbelt on, went through all the normal stuff, and, uh, and the plane took off. No worries, no worries whatsoever experienced a little bit of turbulence right in the beginning. Just, just the plane kind of jumped a little bit. And when the plane jumped, my stomach jumped. I mean, it just went, not, uh-oh. And, uh, and I thought that was nothing. You know, <laughs> you know the feeling you get? Like, what was that exactly? And then the, the plane jumped again and my stomach jumped again. Next thing I knew, you know, I, I made my way to the uh, back of the plane. They have a little area there. For people like me, it's not nearly big enough, but I managed to squeeze in there and I spent the rest of the flight. Every time the plane moved, uh, I was moving every single time. And when I finally was able to compose myself, I, I got back to my seat and I thought, what, what is in this tea? I put two and two together. It has to be the tea. And in haste, I realized that I grabbed where I was supposed to grab throat coat. I grabbed a tea and I'm looking at, it's called, it was called Smooth Move. That was the name of it. And I had taken a whole cup of, of Smooth Move. And I don't believe I just said that from the pulpit of First Baptist Church on a Sunday morning in Hammond, but I did. So, uh, Bear with me, all right? I'm really hesitant to do any kind of self-medication uh, ever since that day, but uh, it's all good. Appreciate the opportunity to preach. I never take it lightly. I love our pastor very much. It's an honor for me to stand here. Those of you that are visiting, please do yourself a favor and be back on Sunday when Pastor Wilkerson is able to be back with us. And we love him here, miss him when he's gone. He's been preaching probably every single night. They're on tour along with the other tour groups that have gone out. So we're anxious to get him back. This morning, I want to preach 
on the two greatest words that a person can ever say. The two greatest words that a person can ever say. In my house, I have a, a book that I've read through a few times, and it's called Great Speeches That Change the World. And I'm reminded of the, the power of words. Great speeches that change the world. And this book outlines how different men like Martin Luther King Jr. and, and others stood and just in one moment delivered one speech that changed everything. Life-changing, history-changing, the power of words. I got thinking about uh, two powerful words. How about these words? And I think you'll agree with me that they're pretty powerful. How about the words, I do? Hey, those are powerful words. Those are, those are covenant words. Those are words, the Bible says that, that those words, the only thing that separates you from your spouse after you say those is death till death do us part. Those words. How about these words? I'm sorry. Now, if you've ever said I do, I hope you've learned to say I'm sorry. All right. If not, then the I do probably isn't going real well, but, but I'm sorry. Those are, those are powerful words, powerful words. And words are powerful, but as powerful as those words are and the many others that we could think of, I believe I found a couple of words here in the text that are more powerful than those words. And frankly, as I'm preaching right now, I believe they're the two most important words that a person could ever say. Because of these words, I'm saved. I'm never going to die and go to hell. I am never going to know what it is to spend one second in an eternal hell to be separated from God because years ago I said these two most powerful words. Because of these words, I have a family that I do not deserve and, and a ministry and I'm actually a preacher. I had no plans to be a preacher. I never thought that God could ever use me uh, to stand in front of a group of people and to preach. And some of you are saying, Brother Judah, we've heard you preach. You were right. And, uh, but regardless, never thought that I could be used as a preacher. But, but these two words came out of my mouth and God set some things in motion. So let's look at these two words in Mark chapter number seven. We're just going to kind of look at this story. We'll get to the words in a moment. Don't get ahead of me because you could probably find them. But look if you would at verse number 24. The Bible says, from thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon and entered into a an house and would have no man know it, but he could not be hid. Boy, I like that phrase. Jesus could not be hid. You know, I got thinking about people in the Bible, about Moses, how Moses was hid in the bulrushes. I got thinking about Elijah, how Elijah ran and he hid himself by the brook and others that were hid. But Jesus is bigger than Moses. Jesus is bigger than Elijah. And he cannot be hid. When God is in the house, he cannot be hid. He's bigger. He was bigger than that house in verse number 24. He is bigger than this house right here. And when Jesus is here, he cannot be hid. We should always keep in mind that in all things, it should be Jesus first. His will. What does God want for the church? And what does God want in my home? And what does God want for my life? We don't want to hide him. He commanded his disciples never to hide their light, and we don't want to hide or at least attempt to hide the Lord Jesus. I love the fact in verse number 24, he could not be hid. We live in a wicked generation. We live in a dark world. The lost world would want to hide and even erase Jesus Christ. But let me remind you, he's a light that shines in a dark place. The Bible says he's the light of the world, and when Jesus is shining, he cannot, he cannot be hid. Now, let me show you why he can't be hid. Look at verse number 25. The Bible says, For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and uh, she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Jesus could not hide in the house for one simple reason. There was somebody that was looking for him. 
You know, we're still living in a day and age where people are looking for Jesus. There are still people right out, maybe right in this room, maybe right outside of this room, but all around us, there are people looking for Jesus. There are people uh, without hope. There are people today who are desperate. There are people today who are searching. There are people right now who have questions and they're not sure where to find the answers. And if you're like that in this church this morning, let me just pause right here and say, Jesus Jesus is the answer to every problem in your life. Uh, You need to start looking for him. This woman was looking for Christ and he couldn't get away. And I want you to know, church, don't ever get the feeling uh, nobody wants to hear about Christ anymore. Nobody's searching for God anymore. Don't believe everything that you hear on the news media because it's not all true. There are people all around us that are looking for Jesus. That's why we run buses. That's why we carry tracks in our pocket. Uh, That's why we pass them out and give them to people and have a friend because we know that people are looking for Jesus. This lady was looking for Jesus. The Bible paints a vivid picture of her desperation. Could you try to transport yourself to the story and see it in your mind's eye? Here's a lady whose daughter, the Bible says, had an unclean spirit. She's at the end of her rope. Her, Her own daughter is possessed, the Bible says, by a demon. I have a daughter. I don't think she's ever been possessed by a couple of times, but no, but uh, no, I have a daughter. I could not imagine, and if any parents in this room, you could, I could not imagine if my daughter was in a situation like that. Here is a lady. I can't imagine the anguish. I cannot imagine the toll that it would take on me and Minda, if somehow we, we discovered that, that Alana happened to be possessed by a demon, I can't imagine the toll it would take on us. I can't imagine the desperation, the lengths we would go to to try to get an answer. It's a vivid picture of this lady. When she finally gets to Christ, she, she falls at his feet. That's what the Bible says. She fell at his feet in verse number 25. She lost her composure, as I'm sure you would do. I don't know how many doctor's appointments she had made. I don't know how many specialists she had sought out. I don't know how many times she had her hopes up that maybe there was an answer. Maybe there was some tea to drink or some medication that would help her daughter's condition, only to find out time and time and time again, there was no answer for her condition. And then she heard about Jesus and she went looking for him. And maybe at first she couldn't find him. He was trying to get away, but, but eventually she tracked him down. And when she, when he finally comes to the door, she falls at his feet, just like you would do, just like I would do. She falls at his feet. Brother Dean Noonan told a story at camp, and I won't get into the whole story, but but he told a story about an incident that happened 20 years ago or maybe longer than that here at City Baptist School where he was preaching, and there was a young boy there who was experiencing some demon oppression, and Brother Noonan told that story, and he, he, boy, we were on the edge of our seats as he told that story. Thank God that boy got deliverance, but... But could you imagine if it was your child? Could you imagine if it was your situation? I have no doubt in my life this was the greatest needs, uh, need of this woman's life. This Greek, the Bible points out, this Syrophoenician, this outcast. This was the greatest need of her life. She was desperate. She went to bed thinking about it. It was the first thing on her mind as she woke up. There's no doubt in my mind this occupied every corner of her brain. Have you ever had a situation in your life that was so serious? You went to bed thinking about it. You woke up thinking about it. Have you ever had something that was so pressing in your world that it just surfaced every time you had a free moment? Have you ever wrestled with something? Have you ever looked for an answer and you couldn't find one? Have you ever been desperate, felt like you were running out of options? had the world closing in on you. That was the case here with this lady. No doubt this little girl was back home. She was being victimized, terrorized, and brutalized by the devil. 
I'm sure she would scream and cry out. Perhaps she was violent. The Bible paints pictures of other people in the Bible who were, who were possessed. And uh, I think of the maniac of Gadara, how, how they would chain him and he would break out of the chains and he lived amongst the tombs. And I don't know the exact scenario with this lady's daughter, uh, but I do know that she was desperate. And this was a great need. She finds Jesus in verse number 24, uh, she, or I'm sorry, verse number, verse number 25, she falls at his feet and she begins to beg in verse 26 that she besought him, the Bible says, she was begging him that he would cast forth the devil out of her, out of her daughter. And look at verse number 27. And this is, this is key. The unthinkable happens. Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled for it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it under the dogs. Maybe she was hoping to find some compassion in the Lord. Maybe she had heard uh, how compassionate he was with everybody else. And here she is, her opportunity to get her problem fixed. And Jesus says, I mean, it's right there. He says, he says, let the children, talking about the children of Israel, first be filled for it is not meat, it is not appropriate to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. A lot of ways to look at this verse, but essentially you could look at it this way. Jesus looked at this lady and said, why would I waste a miracle on you? Man, think about that for a moment. There, I came to minister to the house of Israel and, and there are still Israelites that need to hear my message and, and you're Greek, you're Syrophoenician. Why exactly would I waste a miracle on you? That's not appropriate. That's not right. How would you feel if you heard something like that? You still with me? Everybody okay? I mean, how, what would you be going? He calls her a dog. I mean, did you, he calls this lady a dog. Now, I've read all the commentaries, and I do understand the theological position here. Uh, I've read one commentary that said this. He said, well, he said, you know, if you look at the Greek word, <laughs> he said that the word that's used there for dog, it's, it's a term of endearment. Really, the, 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 and maybe it is, I don't know, but he said he, said he wasn't calling her like a, a, a loose dog. He was calling her more like a puppy, a puppy, a term of endearment. Listen. I've never met somebody that enjoyed being called a dog. Whether, whether it's a puppy or not, Brother Woosley here is one of my best friends in the whole wide world. If Brother Woosley came to me with some great need, if he came to me with a great struggle, if he, if he poured his heart out to me, and I said, you know, Brother Woosley, you kind of remind me of my puppy back in, when I was seven years old. Every time I see you and I hear your trouble, I think a little spot. He was such a cute little dog. Run along now, run along. I mean, would that be any better? Then if I just outright called him a dog, look, regardless of how you parse this thing out, she came to Christ and was called a dog. And, and look at what this lady says. Look at her response. Because her response today, I believe, are the two most important words that could ever be said. Look at what she said in verse number 28. She answered and said unto him, look at those next two words. Say them out loud with me on three. One, two, three. Yes, Lord. Can you say them again on three? One, two, three. Yes, Lord. There it is. Those are the two most important words that could come out of your mouth this morning. I believe those are the two most important words that could come out of any person's mouth. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. She could have reacted a million different ways, and yet something inside of her said, yes, Lord. She understood. She said, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And do you know that, that she didn't have to say yes to God? She could have said no. You know it is possible to be close to Jesus and to be saying no to him? You know it is possible to come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but inside of your heart, you are not saying, yes, Lord, you are saying no. Do you know the most important thing you could do today is make sure that in every area of your life, you are saying yes to Jesus? I wonder how many times Judas Iscariot said no. As he walked with Christ and, and served with him, I wonder how many times, boy, he felt that conviction. 
Judas, you shouldn't do this. Judas, you, you really don't want to be the one that betrays Jesus. He had every opportunity to say yes, and yet as close as he was, he said no. I wonder how many times Samson, as he went through his life, and Samson, one of the great tragedies of the Bible, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord fell upon Samson more than upon any other man in all of Scripture. He knew God. He knew what it was to be close to God. I wonder how many times God gave him an opportunity to say yes, to give in, to surrender his pride, uh, uh, but yet he said no to God. And there are people in this room, I have known people that came to church and lived and died saying no to Jesus Christ. My friend, the most important thing you can say today is yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. This lady said yes when it looked like she wasn't going to get what she wanted. I have found in my Christian experience, sometimes the only reason we serve the Lord is because of what he can give to us. Kind of like in John chapter number six, those people that served as long as Jesus was passing out the bread, but as soon as the miracle stopped, they walked away. Listen, this lady had no idea what was going to happen, yet she said yes to God. I want to give you a few thoughts today on this passage. We're going to be done three ways, three ways, three things I want you to see about how this lady said yes to God. Number one, she, had, she said yes, Lord, when she had reason to be offended. And I want you to think about that. She had every reason in the world to be offended. Here she is desperate. Here she is at the end of her rope. Here she is falling at the feet of Jesus, the one who she had faith enough to believe could help her. And yet he kind of brushes her off initially. He, he calls her a dog, however you want to look at it, a term of endearment or not. He calls her a dog. He, he kind of gives her the idea that maybe he's not going to help her after all she had heard, how he helped everybody else, after all she had heard. And here it is her time. And he's kind of saying no initially. She had reason to be offended. She had good reason to be offended. She could have walked away mad at Christ. She could have walked away uh, upset. But the truth of the matter is, she still said yes to God. I've had people get mad at me for no reason. I've seen people get mad at church. I've seen them get mad at maybe how a decision was handled. I, I've seen them get upset and bitter at, at people. And, and I've seen teenagers get mad at teachers. I've seen uh, husbands and wives get mad at each other. And maybe they had reason to be offended. But my friend, even when you have good reason to be offended, you should still say yes to God. You should still say yes to God. Life is not fair, never has been fair, never will be fair. It's not an episode of Andy Griffith. It's not, pastor is not Sheriff Andy. He really isn't. And no matter, listen, he can't fix every problem in the world in a 24-minute episode. That's just impossible. We are going to be offended from time to time. Man, Brother Keith offended me earlier. And I forgot what he said because I let it go. But I know. He said something, but, but I just know that I'm not going to give him anything on Father's Day. And I'm going to encourage his children to not do it either. But uh, regardless, I'll tell him, give that money to missions. <laughs> but uh, regardless, listen, you, Jesus said, marvel not that offenses come. You and I, let, let's, just, let's just figure this out. We are going to be offended. The truth of the matter is, there are going to be things that happen that aren't fair, that aren't right, that hurt our feelings. There are going to be uh, people that say things that should never be said. And we're going to feel that. And if all it takes, friend, you listen to me right now. If all it takes is a good reason for you to start saying no to God, Satan will supply you with many. There have been many times in my life where I said, man, God, why is this happening to me? I'm trying to do everything right. Everything seems to be going wrong. Uh, wh what's the problem here? And it's easy to become offended, but we need to say yes, even we have reason to be offended. This is the most foolish story, but I'll go ahead and tell it. I can remember I was in Bible college, and I was, I was uh, working in Bolingbrook, Illinois, right off, of, right off of 55. You take 55 South and uh, get off at an exit there. And I was working in Bolingbrook about 45 minutes away from here, working kind of a hybrid second shift, third shift, it called to preach. I'm at Howes Anderson. I'm, I'm going forward for God, excited about it. I can remember one night, it was about two o'clock in the morning. I was driving down the road and uh, I was the only one on 294 trying to get back to Blue Island, and you know the fateful, I mean, here I am, I'm driving, I, I don't know how fast I was going, I don't think I was going too fast, but all of a sudden, the, the road behind me lights up, boop, boop, 
I start to see the flashing lights. This is a situation I've grown quite accustomed to, but uh, I start to see the flashing lights and man, I pull off on the side of the road and the police officer gets out of the car. She looks at me and she says, do you know how fast you were going? I said, I, I, no, I don't. I don't. I said, I don't think I was going too fast, but I, I don't know how fast. She said, you're going 58 miles an hour. It's a 55. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm the only person on the road. And I start processing this. I'm thinking to myself, okay. <laughs> and you know how you start, I mean, all of it, you know. Isn't there enough crime in this area for you to go find somebody? I mean, I'm sorry, but I didn't say it. But I said, oh, okay. She said, license and registration. I gave her my license and registration. She went to the back and I thought to myself, I thought, surely I'm just gonna get a warning here and you know, it'll just be quick and I'll be, I'll be fine. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've been there. I'm just going to get a warning. She was back there for five minutes, 10 minutes. After about 10 minutes, you start to think, well, maybe I'm not going to get a warning. Maybe, maybe she's running, you know, some uh, Homeland Security records on me. Who knows? But uh, she, she came back. When she came back, she said, I know you're only going three miles an hour over. I said, yes, I was. She said, but here, she handed me a ticket. She said, you're free to go to court. You're free. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute. And I said, are you serious? She said, very serious. I said, okay. Off she went. Now, I was a little upset at that. But you let it pass. It's a minor infraction. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, just, I, just, I just let it go. Went home, went to sleep, went to school the next day, went to work. The next night on the way home from work. Two nights in a row. Now, the next night, I am watching, I am watching my speed the next night, okay? I'm the only one on the road, but I'm at 55, brother. I mean, I am, I'm, I know that I, I might even, it, it might have been 54, but I'm, I'm driving down the road smooth, no problem. I get to right around that area where I was pulled over the night before, checked my speed again, I was good. So right when I thought I was through it all, it lights up again right behind me. Boop, boop. I thought, what is going on? There's no way. I was not speeding, no. I pull over, same lady, same lady. If she's listening to this, Hope she gets saved by the grace of God, but, uh, and I do, I do, deep down inside. But uh, the same lady, she pulls me over, and I'm sitting there, and I saw her walk, and, and she said, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, well, I, I wanted to say, remember me? <laughs> I didn't, but I said, it's not because I was speeding, because I was not speeding. She said, no, you weren't speeding. She said, illegal lane change. You changed lanes, you didn't use your, your, your turn signal. <laughs> I said, ma'am, there is, there is nobody out here. She said, I'm here. I said, oh. <laughs> Gave me another ticket. I, I, on the way home, now you listen to me. Th this, is, this is an absurd story. This is like a Brother Moffat story. You want to finish it for me? No, but uh, on the way home, I began to, I was mad, I was offended, I was upset. Now let me just be real honest with you. I was upset at that lady, but I was upset at God. Is that okay to admit? I thought, Lord, here I am trying to serve you. Here I am trying to do what's right, working my fingers to the bone. I'm working all night long at this trucking company called to preach. And, and I, I'm like, God, I don't have the money. You know I'm in college. I'm broke as a joke. I don't have the money for these tickets. And I began to think, Lord, maybe you don't want me to preach. Lord, maybe, maybe it was all emotionalism that night at camp on a Thursday night. Maybe, it was, maybe I shouldn't be in Bible college. Maybe I shouldn't be doing something else. And it just, man, my mind went wild. I went to school the next morning, and I went to work, and I'm talking to two of my best friends. Our teenagers know them now, Andy and Ted Dahl. They were two of my best friends in the world then, two of my best friends in the world now. They had heard about the story. Man, I was very discouraged. I was very upset. Andy Dahl was a senior in Bible college. He came up to me, and he put his arm around me, and he said, hey, man, I don't know why I'm telling you this. He said, but I'm just going to say it. I know life is tough, but don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. You know what? I needed to hear that. Hey, I had reason to be offended. I had reason to be upset. Good reason. That was absurd. That was unreasonable to give a poor little college student two tickets in a row. I wasn't doing anything wrong. Just a few miles an hour over the speeding limit. Just a slight illegal lane change. But really, in the grand scheme of things, what does it matter? You know what? I, I've known people that get offended over something just like that. Next thing you know, they're saying no to God. They're saying no to church. They're saying no to Sunday school. Man, they stop giving. 
They stop tithing to the Lord. And, and in their mind, they've got some good, justifiable reason. I want you to understand that this lady, as I read the story, she had good reason to be offended, yet she still said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. My friend, Satan wants to drive a wedge between you and the will of God. He'll use people, he'll use circumstances, anything it'll take to get you to say no. We need to say yes, yes, we have reason to be offended. Adoniram Judson ministered 15 hours a day for six years before he saw his first convert. This missionary had wives die on him, babies die on him. He was so depressed when his wife Anne died that he literally dug a grave next to her grave. And he dug a hole. He stood at the edge of the hole and he asked God to strike him dead so he could fall in the hole next to his wife. He was not given an easy road. He spent 13 years in prison before his ministry really got off the ground. And after children dying, wives dying, 13 years imprisoned, it was there in prison that he translated the Bible into the Burmese language, the Bible that they still use to this day. I'm glad he didn't say no to God. I'm glad he didn't let some offense, some, some, some difficult thing stop him from doing the will of God. Number one, she said yes when she had reason to be offended. Number two, she said yes when she did not know the outcome. Think about that. She had no guarantees that Jesus was going to heal her daughter. She didn't know. She didn't know if he was going to say yes or no. Matter of fact, it was trending the wrong way. She had no idea what the outcome would be, and yet she still said yes. Many of us want God to lay out his will for our lives. We want to see the blueprints. We want to examine all of it from the front to the end, the wins, the wheres, the, the whos, the how muches. Uh, we, want to, we want to make sure we understand it all before we say yes. And that is not the way the Lord works. We need some men and some women of God in this church who will just say, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do what God wants me to do in whatever situation I'm in. The plan is revealed after we say yes. Typically, that's how the will of God works. The plan is revealed after we say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let me ask you a question. What are you saying to God today? I mean, are you saying yes or no to the Lord? I can remember I told the story at camp and teenagers, forgive me. Our home church had a church split. I was a freshman in Bible college. Church splits are a terrible thing. One side of the church gets mad at the other side of the church and our church was going through it. It's a terrible thing. We had a church split there and I kind of left the church and joined First Baptist and, and uh, uh, just kind of tried to put the whole thing in my rearview mirror. I was praying one night in my room and I was asking God for something. I don't even remember what I was praying for now, but I do remember this. I felt like my prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. You ever feel that way? I felt like God wasn't hearing anything that I was saying. Now, I knew, I knew theologically that, that he hears everything, but I felt, like, I felt like he wasn't listening to it. And I remember saying, Lord, are you listening? And as soon as I said that, a face popped into my mind. A man from my old church. His name's Chuck Alberts. I can give you his name. He's a good man. He's a deacon in the church. He was my employer. He ran a landscaping uh, company, and he would have some of the young men in the church help him out. That's how I paid my way through Christian school, and he was good to me. He was gracious to me, but in this church split, he found himself on the other side of the church split. Him and I were at odds, and I had just walked away, and I said, God, and this was way in the rearview mirror. I said, God, God, why aren't you listening to my prayers? And Chuck Alberts popped in my mind. And I knew, watch this, I knew. I could put it off, I can compartmentalize it, I could just say the past is in the past, I could do all of that, but I knew in my heart there was a man on planet Earth that I needed to forgive. I knew it. You, you, ever, you ever been in that position? Maybe you had some bitterness towards somebody, you had some difficulty, and, and you never did make it right. Maybe it wasn't even your fault, but, but it was there, and, and every time it came to the forefront of your mind, you just pushed it aside. Let me tell you something, my friend. Jesus would want us to forgive one another. First words on the cross that he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he gave us an example that we should follow in his steps, and a child of God shouldn't have bitterness in their heart towards anybody. 
but I had bitterness in my heart towards Chuck Alberts. And it was like, God said, Abdel, uh, no, you'll never get another prayer answered until you get right with Chuck. I finally got up and man, I was convinced and Chuck liked, or he liked orange crush, the drink, the pop, orange crush. It was raining outside, pouring the rain. I can remember getting my little Chevy Cavalier and driving over to Worth, Illinois. No, Justice, Illinois, where Brother Chuck lives. And I drove over there to Justice, Illinois, stopped at a 7-Eleven right by his house, bought a case of Orange Crush, drove to his house. I was scared as could be. Knocked on his back door. Brother Chuck is a big mountain of a man. He's a huge man, a landscaper. Man, it was like he could pull trees right out of the ground without equipment. I don't think he could, but maybe small bushes. But regardless, he was a, he's a big man. And I knocked on the door. And if you could see me, just pathetic, standing there, uh, rain dripping down, holding a, a, a case of Orange Crush that was getting increasingly more flimsy by the moment. And I'm standing there. He opened up the door, hadn't talked to him in over a year. Our last conversation was not good. I had some bitterness in my heart. Man, I just wanted to forget about it. I, I would be fine if I had never seen him again. But here I am standing there. I, I had it all planned out. Brother Chuck, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. But I didn't even have to say anything. As soon as he saw me with the poor and rain and orange crush. He, he grabbed the crush and he kicked me out. No, I'm just kidding. That big old mountain of a man gave me a big hug. Hey, that story might not mean anything to you, but in that moment, we got right with each other. We got right with God. That's a biblical thing. I didn't know what the outcome would be. I didn't know that our relationship would be restored. I, I had no idea, but I knew that I needed to say yes to God. I knew I had to stop saying no. No, I had to say yes. The plan is revealed after we say yes. You know, it's funny. I don't, I don't know that I, I, I do know this. My senior year in high school, my pastor looked at me and this is what he said. You know how you go for a senior appointment? I went to my pastor. I said, pastor, what do you think I should do with my life? My pastor looked at me and he said, Abdel, sit down. I sat down. This is what he said. This is the the great advice, sage advice. And he said, Abdel, he said, I think you could do just about anything in the will of God. I think you could be a preacher, an, e an evangelist, a missionary, a pastor. He said, I have one piece of advice for you. He said, you should probably never become a youth pastor. <laughs> he did, he said that. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, why? He said, I don't think you have patience for teenagers and just kind of the way you were raised. I don't know. I mean, if God's in it, you could do it. But you're asking me, I don't think you should ever be a youth pastor. And so I went to Hiles Anderson College I never even tried to take a youth class. I don't know that I took a youth class unless it was required. I do know that I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention because in my mind, I was never going to be a youth pastor. I met my wife. She asked me what I wanted to do. And this is what I told my wife, like date number one, very first date. We're in the, the golf course at the school. She said, what do you want to do? I said, oh, well, I'll tell you what, right now. I'm a preacher. I'm going to be a preacher, you know. And she said, well, what kind? And this is what I told her. I said, I'm going to start a church in Arizona. You remember that? And for four years in college, I was going to start a church in Arizona. I don't know where that came from. I don't know how that got placed in my mind. Have you ever seen my wife? If I sent her to Arizona, man, with that fair skin, <laughs> it would be a disaster. But she hung in there with me. And uh, I was going to start a church in Arizona, start a church in Arizona. Through a series of events, an assistant pastor at this church, looked, and I went four years, going to start a church in Arizona. An assistant pastor at this church was used of the Lord after I graduated. He looked at me and he said, you know, Abdel, Brother Hiles had passed away. And he said, you know, Abdel, he goes, I, I don't know what you should do. Everything's kind of in flux around here. He said, but I, I've heard Brother Hiles say this a time or two. Given that you've not been saved very long, he would probably tell you to be an assistant pastor for a few years before you went off to start that church in Arizona. And when that man said that, it clicked in my heart. And now I was faced with a decision. Was I going to do what I had dreamed of doing for four years, starting a church in Arizona? Or was I going to submit myself to what I thought God was telling me to do? God, if I'm an assistant pastor, where am I going to go? Who, who am I going to work for? What's he going to ask me to do? I, had, I didn't have the answer to any of those questions. Well, what if he sends me to, what, what, if, what if the assistant pastor, what, what if the church is in the south? I'm born and raised on the south side of Chicago. South side of Chicago is about as far south as I got the whole time growing up. Blue Island was about as far south as I got. I was scared to death to go to south of the Mason-Dixon line. I thought, man, those people, anybody here from the south? God bless you. Uh, okay, good. Well, I know now, but back in the day, I thought, man, I can't. I wouldn't fit in down there. Pastor Lamb called me from West Virginia. I thought, West Virginia? 
I didn't even know it was a state. I thought it was the western part of Virginia. Hey, let me tell you something. You just say yes to God. You just, you just say yes to God. You teenagers that just graduated, just say yes to the Lord right now. You don't have to know it all. You don't have to see every step of the way. This, your life is not your life uh, to, to approve. You ought to just say, God, here's my life, and I approve whatever you're going to do. Say yes to the Lord when you do not know the outcome. And finally, I have to hurry, but this is perhaps the most important point. You ought to say yes, Lord, for the sake of others. Say yes, Lord, when you have reason to be offended. Yes, Lord, when you do not know the outcome. And finally, yes, Lord, for the sake of others. In this whole dramatic scene, let us not forget that there was a little girl back home who needed Jesus. And all that was going on, there was a little girl who needed a mother to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And my friend, it really isn't about you. There are people in this world that need you to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. There are some children. Hey, maybe there's a family that's struggling right now. Maybe there's a mom and dad struggling and you don't know the outcome and you have reason to be offended. You need to do the right thing, my friend. Say yes to God for the sake of your children, for the cause of Christ. You need to say yes, Lord, for the sake of others. People who need us to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here today. You've been wondering for a long time, should I get baptized? People struggle with that. Should I get baptized? I'm going to tell you right now. Yes, you should. If you've been saved, you should get baptized after you're saved. You ought to just say, yes, Lord. Maybe there's people right now, you know, should I come back to church on Sunday night? Should I come back to church on Wednesday night? I mean, uh, life is busy and, and I, I'm here every Sunday morning. And what's the big deal about a Sunday evening service? Look, I'm just going to stop and say, the Bible says so much the more as you see the day approaching. And there just may be some people who need you to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'll put my time aside. I'll come back to church. Hey, maybe you're sitting here wondering, uh, should I tithe? And, and should I give 10% of my income to the Lord? Should I learn to give to missions? And we're wrestling with that back and forth. I promise you, there are some people who need you to say yes to God. Yes, Lord. This past week, it was, it was great. I was in Gulfport, Mississippi. Just like I told you the story about wrestling to come to Hammond or come to West Virginia. I can remember when Pastor Wilkerson called and he asked me to consider praying about coming to be the youth pastor here at the church. Boy, I wrestled with that. Man, I wrestled with that. I thought to myself, if I, if I come to be the youth pastor at the church, Brother Woosley, I will never start that church in Arizona. It's just not going to happen. And I wrestled, and I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, eventually said yes to the Lord like I should have done the first time. Came here a few years ago. That very first youth group had a lot of special young people in it. But I can remember two in particular as I tell this story. I can remember Craig... And Stephanie, carpenter, not carpenter at the time. Craig was a carpenter. Stephanie wasn't, but eventually she got it figured out. And uh, I can remember them. They were seniors when I came. They were seniors. I wanted to have an impact on their life. I, I hope I did. I think I may have had a small part, small impact on their life. Craig and Stephanie graduated, went off to Bible college, got married. Craig started a business. And, and Craig Carpenter is no stranger to most of us in this room. Went off and started a business, and man, he wanted to do something for the Lord. He just felt like there was something more that God wanted, but he was nervous. Look, he was nervous. He, he, this church came up in Gulfport, Mississippi. Position to be a Christian school principal came up in Gulfport, Mississippi. And he asked me about it. It just so happened, it just so happened last year when this opportunity came up for Craig that I was, I was going to be down there. Met the pastor, and he asked me all kinds of questions about Craig. I had to lie about half of them. No, I'm just kidding, but just kidding. He asked me all kinds of questions about Craig and Stephanie, and I, I gave him just honest answers. And he called Craig and Stephanie, and long story short, they ended up moving down there last week. They're at the youth conference where I was preaching. They were sitting there together in a row with some young people that they had brought from across town for the youth conference. Two of the young men in Craig's group stood up during one of the services. Two of the young men stood up, came down the aisle, got saved. It was wonderful. I, I, I'll tell you what was wonderful about it. Craig came up to me afterwards. 
And he said, Brother Judah, he said, something weird is going on. He said, I want to listen to the preaching, but, but I can't, I'm having a hard time listening to the preaching because every time you say something that I know the young people need to hear, I, I find myself looking at them and praying for them and wondering if they're listening. He said, is that okay? I said, Craig, I've been there a million times. I don't listen to half the sermons that I hear. I'm always praying for some teenager that needs to hear it. He said, okay, I just want to make sure that was okay. I said, it's fine, Craig. You keep praying for him. You keep on, keep on going. Can I tell you the blessing that I received all week long last week, watching Craig and Stephanie minister to a group of students, watching them get excited as they made decisions, watching them, you know, tear up as they went down to the altar. Craig came to me and he said, Brother Joe, I've never seen those two guys. They've never moved before. They've never gone to the altar before, but they went today. Man, that is awesome. God's doing something in their life. We went out on Friday night and Craig had me in the hotel till 1.30 in the morning. 1.30 in the morning. We were eating pizza, talking about life, and it was all good. I finally said, Craig, I've got to go. Man, I got in the elevator and Craig stopped me. He said, Brother Jay, I just want to, I just want to make an impact for God. I just want to make it. I said, Craig, you are making an impact for God. You're making an impact on me right now. Let me go. No, but hey, watch this. Watch this. I'm glad I said yes, Lord. If I could play just a small part in a young couple's life like that, I'm glad I said yes, Lord. Watch this. They're glad they said yes, Lord. If he told me once, he told me a dozen times. Not making as much money as I made in Hammond. Not, not you know, got to figure some things out. And then a big old smile across his face. But I know I'm in the will of God. This is great. Can I say, look, my time is up. Can I just say, though, you're never going to re regret saying yes to Jesus. There are other people that need you to say yes to Jesus. Is there anything surfacing in your heart right now that you need to get right with God? I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it. I have more stories to tell, but we're about done. That meeting at Gulfport, we walked into the meeting, and this church always goes above and beyond in their decorations, like above and beyond. And this year, the theme was the Great White Throne Judgment. We pulled into the parking lot of the church. When we pulled into the parking lot of the church, they had it all decorated like we were halfway through the Great Tribulation period. They had taken cars. Now, they're in the South. So they found a car. And they put it in the field, and they got all the men of the church together with their guns. And they just shot up this car, burned it, set it on fire, took deer blood, put it inside. I mean, it was quite, quite riveting. Placed it out front, put barbed wire around it, you know, big signs, keep out, go back. I mean, I thought zombies were about to come out. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy, but they were trying to depict the scene of the tribulation period. Walked into the church building and they had it all decorated. Walked into the auditorium and the whole auditorium was gleaming white. They had sheets and all kinds of things, just, all, just, just white. They had stairs leading right up to the, to the platform. And on the platform was a book that was open that said the Lamb's Book of Life. And behind the Lamb's Book of Life was a massive floor to ceiling, great white throne. And that was the scene. You know, it dawned on me. We won't always be able to say yes to God. The day will come where there's no more chance. Hey, friend, if you're sitting here today and you're lost without Christ, if you're sitting here today and you've never been born again, if you're sitting here today and maybe you found yourself in church, but the truth of the matter is you've been hurt before and you've got reason to be offended and you're not sure how it would all work out if you got saved, let me just stop and say, uh, it's between you and the Lord, but you won't always have tomorrow to say yes to God. If he's knocking on your heart right now to get saved, to get born again, let me encourage you. I beg you, if I could force you, I would. If I could wrap a chain around you and drag you to Calvary, I would do it, but I can't. It's a personal decision that you'll have to make. You got a time and a place where you accepted the Lord Jesus into your heart. Do you have a time and a place? Can you take me back to a moment in time where you said, yes, Lord, Maybe you had to say no to the traditions of men. Maybe you had to say no to what you've always been taught. No for what everybody would say. I've seen young people get saved. Everybody thought they were saved, but they knew in their heart that they weren't. They, they have to fight that. What's everybody going to say? What's everybody going to think? Maybe you have to say no right now to putting it off. One more service. Let me encourage you. Say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You stand before God someday. 
You'll be glad that you said yes to Jesus Christ.